From Microbe TV, this is TWIP, This Week in Parasitism, episode 204, recorded on March 24th, 2022. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and joining me today from Fort Lee, New Jersey, Dixon de Pommier. Hello, everybody, and hello, Vincent. Out my window, um, it's a pretty grotty day. It's it's cold. It's a little misty. Um, I can't see the second tower, the George Washington Bridge. It's um, It sounds like uh, Glasgow weather, but I understand that Glasgow is having some wonderful weather right now. Dixon, I can't see either part of the bridge from no, where you, I am. Well, you have, you're, you're shut off from the world. I am shut off from the world. Also joining us from New York, Daniel Griffin. Hello, everyone. Welcome back. Welcome back, Daniel. And from Glasgow, Scotland, Christina Naula. Hello, Christina. Hi, everybody. It's good to see you all. You have nice weather in, in Glasgow? Well, we do have. To, well, the last few days have been really beautiful, um, warm. I did go up to the hills today for a wee walk with the dog. Actually, Daniel went up to that same hill with me before when he was huh. visiting. So, um, yeah. Is that nice, I can, Daniel? I'm, I'm picturing it in my head. Mm, so, when you say up the hill, is it really a hill or is it? Yeah, well, it's, a, it's kind of, it's not a Swiss mountain, I should say. It, it was kind of a, okay. a gentle Scottish hill. Um, not Very too nice. far away from Glasgow, but beautiful. So when, when yeah. you, you take your dog up, your dog up the, for a wee walk. Do you take your dog up to walk so it can wee, or do you take your wee walk <laughs> so the dog can walk? <laughs> it probably did the odd wee, um, but I didn't pay attention because I went with a friend, so we were just chatting and gotcha. letting the dogs run. Yeah, right, and do whatever right. they do. Time to dive into our last case from episode 203. Daniel, let's uh, get a review of what's going on. All right. For, so for those of you um, tuning in for the first time or those of you tuning back in, a bit of a refresher, <clears throat> two individuals uh, said it was the same issue, a little bit of a hint there, um, small village in Ghana near a fast-flowing river. Um, we have a teenaged boy. And his father, his father's a farmer, um, the boy develops a severe itchy rash on his right leg. There are some areas that are light, some areas that are dark. Um, they live nearby. They don't actually live in the village. Um, but the father farms right there near the river. And after school, um, the boy would come and that he and his father would go swimming in the river. Um, the father's in his 70s. Um, and has a two to three centimeter nodule, firm nodule on his left knee, uh, second one in the groin area, no other problems. Um, we do ask about visual, and he says, oh, I can see just fine as long as you're super close to me. Um, <laughs> the nodules are firm. And this is an interesting feature, fixed to the skin. Like it feels like it's attached to the skin, not underlying tissue. Um, and both undergo a special procedure, a skin snip. Our listeners were very good this month. We have yes, a lot they of were. Oh, guesses. No. <laughs> so, Dixon, why don't you start? All right. Deborah writes, from Portland, Oregon, where the high is 3C and the low is minus C, minus 4C, either this one is so easy that there'll be a couple of dozen correct answers or I'm way off. Internet search for mass drug administration parasite shows that there are three parasitical diseases being addressed in this way, schistosomiasis, malaria, and onchocerciasis. Diagnosis of schistosomiasis is done through examination of stool and urine, so not that. Diagnosis of malaria is done through a blood smear, so not that. Diagnosis of onchocerciasis is done through a skin snip check. Onchocerciasis often uh, causes intense itching and results in patches of hyperpigmentation and depigmentation. Check, check. Onchocerciasis often has hard subcutaneous nodules, most commonly found on head in South America and near the groin in Africa. 
Check. Blindness due to onchocerciasis often begins with myopia. Check. Hence my diagnosis in quote is onchocerciasis due to O. volvulus, infection from black fly bite. Treatment, according to CDC, is ivermectin to kill larva and doxycycline to kill Wolbachia bacteria that the adult worm depends upon. One caveat, the parasitic worm, Loa can also result in edgy skin and is common in Yana, although I find no reference to blotchy pigmentation or specificity for the groin. The nodules of loiasis migrate <clears throat> instead of staying in one place. Also, L. loa can infect eyes, but I find a reference to it causing blindness, even though the symptoms don't match uh, <clears throat> loiasis. I'd run a PCR on the skin snip just, or look at the blood smear, or do an antibody test. Just to rule it out, as those with loa loa, when treated with ivermectin, can develop encephalopathy. If it's loiasis, doubtful, treat with diethylcarbamazine. While loiasis should be ruled out before treatment, I still think it's river blindness, angocerciasis, Deborah. Christina. Eyal writes, good evening, sages of knowledge from Sydney, Australia, where it hasn't stopped raining in a week. First, I'm very happy that the individual from the Rohingya camp has not succumbed to COVID and is on the mend. As to my guests, listening to Dr. Griffin's description, including working next to a fast-flowing river and the father's poor eyesight, made me think of river blindness. Looking through the WH WHO website on onchocerciasis, I get, onchocerciasis or river blindness is a parasitic disease caused by the filarial worm Onchocerca volvulus, transmitted by repeated bites of infected black flies, Similium species. These black flies breed along fast-flowing rivers and streams close to remote villages located near fertile land where people rely on agriculture. Check. In fact, Infected people may show symptoms such as severe itching and various skin changes. Check. Infected people may also develop eye lesions which can lead to visual impairment and permanent blindness. Check. In most cases, nodules under the skin form around the adult worms. Check. Onchocerciasis is endemic to Ghana. Check. Also, it says that population-based treatment with ivermectin, also known as mass drug administration or MDA, is the current core strategy to eliminate onchocerciasis. Another clue. Finally, I couldn't see the recommended diagnosis on the WHO website, but from the CDC it looks, like, looks that the most common method of diagnosis is the skin snip. A 1 to 2 milligram shaving or biopsy of the skin is done to identify larvae, which emerge from the skin snip and can be seen under the microscope when shaving or biopsy. The skin snip is put in physiologic solutions, for example, normal saline. Typically, six snips are taken from different areas of the body. Polymerase chain reaction, PCR, of the skin snip can allow for diagnosis if the larvae are not visualized. So everything lines up with my original bias. So my guess of onchocerciasis stands. Can't wait for the next episode. Thank you so much. Daniel. Sarah writes, dear TWIP team, it's 34 degrees F, 2 Celsius, and aggressively windy in Philadelphia. It is so windy, in fact, that I was quite literally almost blown off a bridge that traverses a large river that bisects the city on my way home. A different fast-flowing river located in Ghana features prominently in this week's case involving an adolescent young man and his 70-year-old father. The son developed an incredibly itchy rash that involved regions of hypopigmentation and lichenification, darkening and thickening, mostly in the right lower extremity. His father has a two to three centimeter subcutaneous nodule evidenced by the inability to move it separately from the skin. On his left knee and a similar nodule in the groin area may be a swollen lymph node accompanied with a new onset myopia nearsightedness. The community they frequent has received community-directed treatment for the pathogen in question, but they have not benefited from these efforts to control this pathogen as they do not reside in the catchment area where treatment efforts are directed. Both patients have a skin snip biopsy that was diagnostic. 
This can only be one thing, two rather, in endosymbiotic relationship. Onco circa volvulus, a filarial worm that is transmitted by black flies, and Wolbachia, a bacterial species that I remember hearing about a few episodes back on TWIP. The skin snips were probably dropped in water, and small microfilaria came swimming out. I believe even the microfilaria are visible to the naked eye, though people often develop hyperopia, nearsightedness, as they age due to the hardening of the lens. A new myopia is not a disease of age. <clears throat> the father's myopia presenting in his 70s is pathognomonic for river blindness caused by the massive human inflammatory response when Wolbachia is released from dying Oncocerca adults in the eyes. I would treat both the father and the son with doxycycline for two months for the Wolbachia and ivermectin once a month for several months, maybe even an entire year for the Oncocerca. I'd start the doxycycline prior to the ivermectin. I'd want to check hepatic function for both them prior to starting ivermectin. I don't actually know how often to dose ivermectin, but I'd want to move gingerly with killing off Oncocerca because I believe killing them too quickly can cause a massive inflammatory response that could lead to distributive shock and even death. I'd provide the sun with di then hydramine cream to relieve the itch because itching can be so awful. For the long term, is there a way to include the two of them in the local Oncocerca control program, which probably involves treating with ivermectin? Thank you so much for yet another incredibly educational and thrilling episode. Sarah MS4, P.S. My significant other who finds parasites too disturbing to listen to TWIP episodes with me commented that the Look of sheer joy on my face must mean there is a new TWIP podcast, a very good diagnostician. Cool. Alexander writes, dear professors, to quote the case description, I went to this small village. We're in Ghana just a couple of weeks ago, and this village is right by this really fast-flowing river, buzzing sound, Oncocerca volvulus. Next. <laughs> <laughs> All the best, Alexander from Vienna, Austria. Cool. Dixon. Uh, let's see if I can butcher this name up a little bit less than I think I'm going to. Yava writes, hello, TWIP team. I recently discovered your podcast and could not be happier. Thanks for all your great work. I'm a second-year resident of infectious diseases at Helsingborg Hospital in Sweden. My residency so far has completely revolved around COVID, and I'm grateful to get a, to learn more about other infectious diseases from all of you. My guess for this case study is onchocerciasis, or river blindness, caused by the nematode onchocerca volvulus. The fact that the father developed visual impairment and nodules under the skin after farming close to a fast-flowing river made me consider this as the most likely diagnosis. The black fly, the vector of disease, breeds at fast-flowing streams. The adult worm <clears throat> gives rise to nodules under the skin, usually around the shoulder and hips. The tissues around these nodules are secondarily loose, uh, they secondarily lose their elasticity, and especially in the groin, so-called hanging groins have developed over time. Let's hope it doesn't come to that. Thanks for yet another great episode. Best wishes from a sunny but cold Malmo, which is one of the great cities of the world. It's ecologically aware of every aspect of climate change and makes every effort to um, address them. Christina. Garrett writes, hello, greetings from Salt Lake City. I'm a postdoc studying infectious disease at the University of Utah. Due to a long-standing fascination with parasites that really started when as an undergraduate, I became amazed by the life cycle of Strongyloides. I have taken much enjoyment from TWIP podcast, but have never submitted a guess. In regards to the father and son reported on episode 203, I think these are two these two are suffering from onchocerciasis caused by onchocerca volvulus. My guess was based initially upon hearing that the father had some vision issues and the two lived near a fast moving stream in a rural area. Onchocerciasis is also referred to as river blindness due to the potential vision changes from infection and its association with fast moving streams where the vector, the simulian black fly, breeds. The CDC's website reports that this disease often presents with nodules under the skin and an itchy rash that takes on a leopard skin appearance. 
which are similar symptoms to what was reported. Diagnosis can be achieved via biopsy, as was performed on these individuals. Thanks for the great podcast, Garrett. Daniel. Patrick writes, greeting TWIP team. I write from southwestern Ontario, Canada, where it is overcast minus 4 Celsius, 25 Fahrenheit, and with negligible wind. Emboldened by a correct diagnosis of the tripartite case in episode 202, I'm hazarding another guess. I do so confidently this time, however, since I feel the case presented in episode 203 can only be one thing. The Ghanaian farmer in his 70s and his teenage son are the unfortunate recipients of a filarial worm infection. The frequent mention of visits to the river seems almost a red herring until the life cycle of the worm's black fly vector, simoleum species, is considered. The mention of the river is also provides a tantalizing link to the common name of this disease, river blindness. The filarial worm in question is Oncocerca valvulus, which presents rather differently from other filarial worms. Between the man and his son, all the manifestations of onchocerciasis appear to be present, except for lymphadenopathy and nodding syndrome. Those present manifestations, those present manifestations include onchodermatitis, itch and discoloration of the legs and the teenage son, nodules, firm nodules around a few sonometers on the father, ocular lesions, presumably as being responsible for the failing eyesight of the father. This last manifestation gives us the common name for the disease. The positive skin snip described in this case is a common way to diagnose onchocerciasis, and I further understand a, understand a skin snip was the means of its discovery. Doesn't skin snip just roll off the tongue? <laughs> All right. Treatment for both will involve long-term administration of ivermectin to target the microfilaria, potentially preceded by doxycycline targeting the Wolbachia and the symbion responsible for the actual pathology. However, it is critical to account for concurrent infections that might complement treatment, especially a concurrent loa loa infection. The consequences of not doing so can be severe. A question for Dr. Griffin. Because of the distance of the father's nodules from his head and eyes, would it still be prudent to surgically remove them as part of the treatment? Thank you again, TWIP team, for your wonderful work. Sincerely, Patrick. Chad writes, hello, TWIPers. Thank you for all the time and effort you put into your podcasts. I've been listening for almost two years now, so it's about time I diagnose a case. I'm only a carpenter cabinet maker but I'm confident I know this one. Well, so is Dixon a cabinet maker, (laughs) right? Yeah. I believe the father and son are hosting Oncocerca volvulus, the fast-flowing river where the two spend most of their time is an ideal environment for black fly larvae. Black flies have had plenty of opportunities to pass along Oncocerca microfilariae, which made their way to the father's knee and groin. Skin snips of the nodules, which have shown modal microfilariae, confirming the diagnosis. Dixon. You're muted. Absolutely right. Adult writes, dear professors, one... Uh, J.L. is Lowenstein Jensen Media, and he has a reference for that online. Two, you mentioned a rapid flowing river, possible visual concerns, and biannual community treatment, which all lead me to think of onchocerciasis immediately. The symbolism of an older father with a teen son also reminds me of the attached statue picture, which strengthens the link. Maybe I'm biased, though. Uh, And then he lists another reference online. He says, he already has a book, which is great. But I was just as as excited about the case. And he lists this wonderful um, photograph symbolizing the old world of onchocerciasis before the invention of ivermectin. And um, the little kid is leading his blind father out to the fields so that he can uh, do the physical labor because the little kid is not old enough yet to actually hold his own <clears throat> in terms of digging and planting seeds, etc. I remember Megden changed all of that, obviously, and um, we've talked about this in the past, but it's good to mention it here, too. Um, <clears throat> a Nobel Prize was given for the discovery and, and uh, implementation of ivermectin. Uh, 
for the treatment of onchocerciasis. And um, one of the recipients is a good friend of mine and, and uh, Vincent's wife and uh, Vincent. And if uh, <clears throat> Christina were in the U.S., she would be a good friend of his as well. <laughs> Christina. Annette writes, hello, TWIP team. Greetings from a grey Braunschweig, Germany. It is 2C37F, waiting for spring. After having guessed right a few times by now, I thought I'd give it to give it a, an official go. My guess is onchocerciasis, as it is controlled with a biannual dose of ivermectin, has a connection to a river, bumps under the skin and a leopard skin appearance, according to Vicky. Thanks all for Thanks for old Twiff keeping me sane and my mind working while working as a cleaning lady. Cheers, Annette. Daniel. Renee writes, they both have onchocerciasis, also known as African river blindness. I haven't won a book yet, so please include me in the drawing. Love the show. Renee from Seattle. Madeline writes, hello, I'm sending in a guest for Twip 203 on behalf of the second year medical students in the Global Health Track at Western University of Health Sciences in Oregon. We think these patients are presenting with onchocercovulvulus, the river exposure, location in the world, the son's severe itchy rash and skin pigmentation changes, and the father's nodules and vision problems are all indicative of onchocercovulvulus. In addition, the typical diagnostic test for this bug is a skin snip. Regular ivermectin distribution in this community in Ghana has likely protected many of the people who live there. But like you mentioned, this dad and son are not residents of the community near the river that is protected by this medication, which is typically given every six months. Look forward to listening to the next podcast. Dixon. Yes, sir. Unmute. <clears throat> Andrew writes, Kiora from Bangarora. My guess for the father slash son case in Ghana is onchocerciasis. Swimming in flowing water, the characteristic leopard skin and the itch, itching point to it. I will not go into details because I'm going to get, I'm going to sit back and enjoy all the wonderful answers like we got in TWIP 202. It was like the legendary Kevin was back, well, almost. The only comment I will make is how silly it is to only treat or give preventative measures for endemic diseases to a certain demographic. In New Zealand, someone was asked to prove their residency before getting a COVID-19 vaccine. The government made it very clear that everyone in the country has the right to get the vaccination at no cost, even those illegally in the country. How else can you prevent a spread of a disease unless you get everyone, right? The point is well made. Thank you for pointing that out. Yeah, I miss Kevin. It's unfortunate yeah. we don't see him anymore. Yeah, 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 yeah. Hope he's okay. Yeah, Christina. Sorry, I'm momentarily distracted by a child crawling under my table, closing the cat <laughs> flaps. <so. laughs> okay. Daniel writes, hello Twipians. Today is 10 degrees C, but definitely feels colder. The rain has started and will continue to shower for the rest of the week by the looks of it. Now to address the two villagers from Ghana. Based on the findings, I'm afraid both have contracted the filarial nematode Onchocerca volvulus. The good thing is it was diagnosed early, as they both still have functional vision. The black fly serves as the vector for the small stage of the worm. These flies require fast-moving oxygenated water to reproduce. Thus, swimming in and living near a fast-moving river will put them both at risk of exposure. In order for the worm to enter the skin, it must first crawl out of the fly's mouth path, parts and then enter the bite, opening after the fly has left. All of this must be done fast and without being swatted or shaken off. Talk about agile. The nodules on the father correspond to the bite sites as Onchocerca tends to stay put after entering the bite opening. These round nodules form from coiled adult worms and their size depends on the number of worms and how large they have grown. And my goodness, can they grow up to three feet? Sexual reproduction produces millions of microfilaria that migrate away from the nodule. This causes skin irritation, itching, and a change in color. 
Connections exist between the subcutaneous tissue and the eyes. And if enough microfilaria find their way, blindness can occur. The nodules on the farmer are quite far from his head, thus it may take some time before the microfilaria reach his eyes. For this reason, I'm not sure if his vision is fading due to the worms or from the naturally occurring cataracts. Looking at the skin snip close to the nodule or the nodule itself will provide a diagnosis. Treat both with ivermectin and resect the nodules. Cheers, Daniel from Canada. Daniel. John writes, Dear Twip Tetrad, greetings from Crichton University in Omaha, Nebraska, where it's a mild 50 degrees Fahrenheit with partly cloudy skies. In celebration of Pi Day, I asked my class to answer your latest case study with this promise of 3.14 extra credit points. Even though we did not cover this parasite in class or in the lab, the students reached an overwhelming consensus with their answer. One possibility is Trypanosoma brucei. Although both father and son did not experience fever or headaches, T. brucei can cause skin rashes and swollen lymph nodes, the farmer of which may account for the son's discolored leg and the latter accounting for the father's nodules. This parasite can be tested for by a blood test. However, it's not... It's likely not T. brucei because the lack of other symptoms like visual impairment and the tsetse fly's habitat of woodlands. It is likely Oncocerca valvulus, which causes Oncocerciasis river blindness. Symptoms include severe itching, visual impairment, and nodules under the skin. It's also endemic to Ghana. Both infected people were near a fast-running stream before infection. Black flies, which vector O. valvulus, breed in fast-running streams. Both infected people experience skin disfigurements consistent with ovalvulus infection. Finally, both infected people experienced itching to treat and administer ivermectin in six-month increments until symptoms subside. Gina writes, the second case, I don't know what the second case means, sounds like what people call river blindness. On chrysarchiasis, you mentioned the water was fast-running in the area, which is what the vector likes. I think it's called colloquially a, ba a black fly. It puts a parasite in people that causes both blindness and skin bumps and itching, which can be severe. The father, I think, although he claims good vision, says that it's only good if he's close to the subject. I also mentioned the father and son only work or visit the region and thus unfortunately aren't getting the preventative treatment. A truly good old-fashioned and well-documented use for ivermectin, if I remember correctly. Keep up the good work, if you please. We will listen. <laughs> Dixon. Oh, Wayne writes, Dear Twip, I was too slow at the last case, guess. Hope this makes it in time. I think both these patients have onchocerciasis, which causes a horrible dermatitis, as well as skin nodules. Diagnosis is made by skin snips. All the best, Owain. Christina. Abdi Aziz writes, Dear Twip, I'm writing from snowy Fargo, North Dakota, where it is minus one Celsius degree. As a long time listener, it's my pleasure to take part today. As a newcomer to the United States and being fifth year medical student back home in Somaliland, I would love to get your advice on where to start, especially medical school in here, where I am also told it is very expensive to study medicine in here. But in my heart, I can't see doing nothing else except studying medicine. So I would really appreciate your advice very much. I think it was only just yesterday watching Vincent explain microbiology on bacteria on my second year of medicine. And by the way, I really appreciate Dr. Daniel Griffin coming to Africa and sharing his knowledge and helping poor African nations. River blindness is the disease that the young boy and his dad suffer. River blindness is a disease spread by black flies, which tend to live near fast running rivers or in streams. Here in America, there are programs to control it, but it still affects about a thousand people per year in America. I presume you mean South America, but that this is a small number comparing to some other countries. The good news is that countries could be free from it, as is, in the, as is the case of Colombia, Mexico, Ecuador, Guatemala, which all were declared to be free from the disease. O. volvulus may bite a person and deposit the parasitic worm larvae into their skin. 
These larvae can enter the skin through the bite wounds. River blindness causes skin and eye problems. Skin rashes appear as an itchy rash that resembles eczema, in which there is small pus filled like blisters, or an itchy raised dark patches on the hands or feet, as in the case of our two patients described by the doctor. The patient had lumps beneath the skin, which measure up to several centimetres, and that is where adult worm lives and grows. It's hard to kill in the lump, as they are adult female and male. The ivermectin will not kill them. The way that river blindness hurts the eyes is that it dies inside the eyes and then causes inflammation, which in return causes a raise in pressure, which hurts the nerve. Swollen lymph nodes could be seen as a symptom too. Treatment for onchocerciasis is with ivermectin for 10 to 15 years, which just kills worm larvae, but not the adult form. Antibiotics such as toxicycline are also used to kill the bacteria, which the parasite feeds upon. Uh, I can't give any advice on studying medicine in the US, I'm afraid. I'll have to leave that to one of you. Let's correct the last statement. Yes? Go ahead. Bac the bacteria that the parasite feeds upon? Yep. I thought it you was want to fix that? You Wolbachia want to make a comment about uh, that? It's I really thought a, it was the Wolbachia that's an endosymbiont. Oh, somebody yeah. just lost me there. I was just trying to think, but yes, yes <laughs> it's obviously very clear, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I think he, mean, he means the bacteria that live within the parasite. Correct. Yeah. And, and by the way, the killing of Wolbachia doesn't result in the death of the parasite. The it makes them infertile, doesn't alive. it? Yes, hmm. indeed. And it also keeps down the damaging effects of the uh, microfilariae. Daniel, All right. you're next. Jaskaret writes, um, and Jaskaret, send us the pronunciation so I get that correctly because I'm Assuming I got it wrong, so let me know next time when you write in. Dear TWIP professors, greetings from the Parasitology Club at University of Central. Dixon, jump in. Um, I'm muted. Uh, wait a minute. No, I'm not. Um, <laughs> Thank you, Lancashire. 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 <laughs> in the beautiful northwest of England. Uh, we would like to add our considered opinion for the case of a father in his 70s and teenage child who reside in a small village in Ghana in sub-Saharan Africa. The boy developed a severe itchy rash in his right leg with light and dark areas, while the father has nodules in his groin area and left knee. The father experiences some visual issues. They both have a diagnostic skin snip. The risk factors include a fast-flowing river in which they both swim, and the father farms near the river. The most probable cause of the condition is the parasitic worm Onchocerca valvulus, which causes onchocerciasis, also known as river blindness. It is a tropical disease transmitted through repeated bites by Simulidae, black flies, Black flies breed near fast-flowing rivers near rural villages. According to Murdoch 2020, the main burden of the disease is found in countries in sub-Saharan Africa. The disease can cause visual impairment due to inflammation of the optic nerve, intense itching, nodules, and rashes. Most symptoms are caused in response to dead or dying larvae. The back fly introduces third stage filarial larvae through the bite wounds. The larvae mature into an adult in nodules of subcutaneous tissue. The female worms are capable of producing microfilaria in subcutaneous nodules for 10 to 15 years. They have a lifespan of 10 to 15 months. They are typically found in skin and lymphatics of connective tissue. They are sometimes found in peripheral blood, sputum, and urine. Microfilaria are ingested by black fly when biting an infected animal and migrate from midgut through hemocele into thoracic muscles where they develop into third stage larva. They can migrate into proboscis and infect an individual. The diagnosis can be performed by skin snip, which is examined by light microscope. Larvae emerge from the skin snip. PCR enables diagnosis in larvae are not visible. Nodules can be removed surgically and examined for the adult worms. Slit lamp examination of interior part of the eye where larvae are visible can be useful in cases of visual impairment. The recommended treatment is ivermectin, 
which only kills the larvae and not the adults. And that's a WHO reference. It is administered every six months if the evidence of infection persists. Doxycycline can be used, it says here, to kill adult worms by killing Wolbachia bacteria on which adult worms thrive. Wolbachia has a symbiotic relationship with many arthropods. A combination of both can be advised in some cases. Thank you for another challenging case on behalf of the Parasitology Club of the Uni University of Central. Lancashire. Lancashire. <laughs> they have some references for us there. Okay. Martha writes, dear Twipsters, I enjoy listening to Twip while doing work around the house. Of course, I have to pause to jot down the clues to the mystery case. This month, I had to rewind to get them all. This is the case of the father and son who farm near a fast-flowing river. They do not live in the local community, so have missed out on the twice-yearly mass drug initiative. The son has a severe itchy rash with skin discoloration on the right leg. The father has firm, fixed nodules on the knee and groin. He also seems to have decreased visual acuity. Diagnosis by skin snips. It seems Dr. Griffin has given as many clues as possible. I'm guessing the parasite is Onchocerca volvulus. Keeping this short, as I expect, you will get many responses this month. Dixon. Yes, sir. Peter writes, a fast-running river in Ghana immediately brings to mind black flies. So let's run through the symptoms noted. Sun, teenager, one, itchy rash, dermatitis, two, changes in skin color, especially on the right leg. Father, in the 70s, in his 70s, one, two to three centimeter nodule on knee, nodule in groin area. Two, poor vision. Diagnostics through skin, skin, skin snip. In the village near the river, there is a mass drug administration program under YMDA. This MDA program involves giving something twice a year. As they say, when hearing hoofbeats, think of zebras, not horses, if you are on the Serengeti, of course. All of the symptoms here point towards river blindness caused by the filarial nematode on circovolvulus. The diagnostic skin snip also fits this picture. Despite the efforts of the African Program for Onchocerciasis Control, APOC, 1995 to 2015, and the follow-up WHO Expanded Special Program for the Elimination of Neglected Tropical Diseases, ESPEN, Onchocerciasis remains highly prevalent in many districts of Ghana. This is in part due to exactly what was noted in this case, failure to recognize important foci of active and transmission adjacent to areas under treatment. So that's my guess, river blindness. <clears throat> the treatment for this is twice a year doses of ivermectin for at least 10 to 12 years, the lifespan of the adult worm that is not killed by ivermectin. The arduousness of this treatment regime emphasizes the need for more effective drugs. And one can dream a vaccine. Writing from cloudy Cape Town, 26C, 78F, and Windy, Peter, P.S., thank you for the opportunity to think about something besides SARS-CoV-2. And he lists some nice references as well. Christina. Okay. Danica writes, hello TWIP team. I recently started a new job as a HIV epidemiologist for an unnamed state health department. We all work remotely, so for team bonding, I suggest that we try each month TWIP case study. That's such a good idea. So here's our combined entry. We think the fishermen, father, son duo have river blindness, onchocerciasis. Thanks for a nice clue of the eyesight struggles and the nearby river. We appreciate this softball to get our group started. Onchocerciasis is caused by the nematode Onchocerca volvulus, an infection that is endemic in Ghana. River blindness is transmitted by the black fly that lives and breathes near fast flowing rivers, streams and rivers. We were stunned by an image and um, we've got a link, well, we've got a partial link for it. Onchocerca parasites emerging like a little worm harpoon from the antenna of the black fly. Evidently, this parasite isn't nice to its fly host either. Symptoms of river blindness include rash, itching bumps, cataracts and nodules under the skin. The nodules contain the adult worms. It can cause blindness and is the second most common infectious cause of blindness after trachoma. Treatment for onchocerciasis is ivermectin, which kills the larvae. 
However, ivermectin does not kill the adult worms. To kill adult worms, doxycycline, an antibiotic, can be prescribed, which kills Wolbachia bacteria inside the adult worms that they depend on to survive. So cool. A caveat to treatment with ivermectin is that patients must first be tested for co-infection of another parasitic infection called Loa Loa. If someone also has Loa Loa, ivermectin can cause serious brain swelling that can lead to coma. From what we would gather, the theory is that ivermectin kills so many microfilaria, many of which are near the eyes and brain, and this mass die-off causes encephalopathy and or hemorrhage of the eyes. This complication of co-infection has greatly impaired mass drug administration programs of ivermectin in areas where river blindness is endemic and now requires a test-to-treat approach. It's always a good idea to think of other causes as not all disease presentations are typical and symptoms can coincide from different causes. For this one, schisto is a possible cause, but it is uncommon in the flowing water and the disturbed vision complaint. Thanks for the interesting case study and an opportunity to chat with colleagues about diseases. All right, that that's great. How many? We had over 20. That's just great. great. A lot. Brilliant. Can, really can I just interject at this moment? Uh, just another correction. Lancashire is one way to pronounce that city's name. Danica. I believe her name is really Danica. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> no, 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 no. Not at all. It's not a common name in, in, no. in anywhere. But no. it, it just happens to be the name of a, a race car driver who was in the news a lot because she was involved with a sports figure, so Danica became a common household name, but it's not a common name. It's easy to mispronounce, so I'm sorry if I pre- appear to be pedantic. We, no, we've that's got absolutely to get fine. Thank you, and <laughs> apologies, Danica, for um, butchering your name. Yeah, well, never again. <laughs> no, I won't. Phonetics. Send us your phonetics. <laughs> All right, Daniel, right. what do we have here? Well, we, we've got a few more guesses, and then I think there was some stuff we should discuss. So um, I'm going to make uh, – well, we'll let Dixon go first because I feel like he has some sort of confidence about what he thinks this might be. <laughs> well, having you – know, uh, sure. I mean, I um, <clears throat> if I uh, wasn't thinking about onchocerciasis, I must have been unconscious. Um, so I would say that it's a pretty obvious diagnosis given the location, given the – the signs and symptoms, um, it's hard to miss this one no matter what. So, I, and I'm not accusing anybody of being, um, let's say, uh, less aware than they should be <laughs> because a lot of these people that write in are not parasitologists. They're not even scientists. I, I love the fact that someone doing housework amuses themselves by challenging them with the information that we're giving out. That's remarkable. That's absolutely remarkable. So, yeah, I, I pick on gastroenteritis. And, um, okay. Christina, what are you thinking? Well, I have to say I made a very unprofessional diagnosis here because the, after you said Ghana and fast-flowing river, I had my mind, my mind made up. So, <laughs> so, obviously, no doctor would really do that. But um, I would also go with um, onchocerciasis. Really interesting case. Right. Yeah. And, uh, I mean, all the clues that everyone so nicely pointed out. Indeed. Point, point to onchocerciasis. Yes, this is a I, pretty I, I straightforward one. I don't think um, doxycycline actually kills the adult worm. I think we should. Yeah, let's talk about. They remain that. alive, and I think even they continue to produce microfilaria. Um, but the inflammation that the microfilaria causes is ablated as soon as uh, Wolbachia disappears. So uh, the pathology of the infection is due to Wolbachia, but the continuation of the infection without Wolbachia is uh, thought to cause no further harm to the host, which is hard to imagine, but that's true. I yeah. think and also from, re- if I remember correctly, Wolbachia renders over time, I think the female's infertile. Um, so, uh, you may be right. And I, I think that, you know, then less microfilaria will be produced as well. Yeah, I will. I, I mean, I'll, I'll make well. a couple comments on that. So, yeah, so, you know, so clearly getting rid of Wolbachia impacts the fertility of the females. Um, right. It is interesting because some people consider, you know, they, they say, oh, doxycycline is macrofilaricidal. But then there's all this literature 
on the pathology, the inflammation is triggered by Wolbachia. So, right. um, you know, so for those people who said that the Wolbachia um, actually is macrofilaricidal, so kills the adult worm, um, there is some literature to support that. But I, I don't know if I'm convinced because what you really would need to do, right, is you need to treat some with doxycycline. And then you need to cut open the nodule and see if the you know if the females are still alive, right? So right. You need to really right. to pin that down. But it's interesting. So, um, but the doxycycline does not have any impact on the microfilaria. So if you treated no. someone just with doxycycline, well, that's right. the itching would continue for 10, 15 months. So um, the way we approach this actually has to do with a couple of things. One is how much symptoms do they have right away? So, um, you know, the ivermectin is really wonderful and very powerful at um, addressing the microfilaria, which also is very important in the transmission cycle. Um, the doxycycline is recommended for people that are outside endemic regions. Why in the endemic regions do we just put someone into the mass drug? Why do we just give them ivermectin twice a year? Why don't we treat people in endemic areas with doxycycline? Because we don't. A um, couple thoughts on this. One is people might get reinfected, right, over time. So if you treat them with doxycycline, are we going to potentially develop some resistance over time? You know, you treat them with doxycycline, they get bit again. You treat them with doxycycline. Um, so it is interesting. If they were to leave that area and come here to the U.S., we probably would first treat them with ivermectin, get the microfilarial load down, then we would sterilize the female with the doxy. Um, but I do wonder about doing it more targeted in some of these areas, right? Because there's no there's no reservoir for oncocerciasis. So oh, if right. we could be a little more aggressive, maybe we can, you know, because yeah, yeah. um, we really are making tremendous progress with this mass drug administration approach. But we have to be, I think, um, one of our... Um, uh, emailers commented on this, we, you know, you have to be a little bit more generous with your encatchment area because they're obviously the fact that these we're still seeing fresh cases means there's people that we're not getting drugged to that we need to get drugged to. Um, but yeah, yeah, that's the life cycle, right? You get bit by the black fly. You end up over a period of time, these adult worms developing and those nodules are kind of characteristic. You can certainly feel the difference. Um, and if you were to open one of these up, the female worm is huge. And there yes. can be multiple females in there. The, the right. adult males are small. And apparently the adult males are, um, shall I use the word promiscuous? They can actually go about from nodule to nodule um, fertilizing um, different females. So, what a life, interesting. eh? Kind of an interesting uh, situation. And in these areas, you're usually not going to have the resources where you're removing these nodules. You're just putting them on this ivermectin mass drug. You're usually leaving the nodules unless there's some sort of physical um, impairment disability that comes with it. Yeah, yeah. So there were several countries in West Africa that refused to participate in this ivermectin giveaway program. And that's a big reservoir that's still there. Um, I think Sierra Leone was one of those countries. And they were the same countries that also refused to participate in the Ebola outbreak. So there's a politics involved in this as well, unfortunately. And um, I don't know what to do about that, actually. Because uh, otherwise, it'll still be there. Yeah. I mean, it made tremendous, tremendous progress. Uh, right. No, I, absolutely. I mean, all but three countries in West Africa don't have it uh, endemic anymore in with the exception of Ghana, perhaps Ghana is a big exception, but uh, Senegal and uh, all kinds of our Cote d'Ivoire, a lot of countries don't have any, which is amazing considering how embedded into the uh, the endemicity of this infection, the and the life cycle and the work habits of the people, everything was in total sync in order to make this thing last forever, basically. And along comes this wonderful drug, Ivermectin, that's uh, quite wonderful. Vincent, remind us again how it works, just as long as we don't uh, talk about <laughs> SARS-CoV-2 treatment at the same time. <laughs> I know your wife worked on the mechanism. So there's a chloride channel in the nervous system, which ah, is right. Right. In hit, which, which the drug binds, and exactly. um, that induces the... The paralysis, I suppose. So my wife, Doris Cully, at working at Merck, um, identified the target as this uh, 
what is it? A sodium gated chloride? I don't remember what the exact name it is. It but does some say kind it's a glutamate gated. Glutamate gated. That's right. Glutamate gated chloride channel. Uh, yeah. Which and and in fact there are other there are other insect species that have uh, right. similar channels and which can also uh, be inhibited by ivermectin. Yes, yeah, so that is absolutely her claim to fame. Yeah, like scabies. Um, so isn't it? I mean, you must obviously laugh and then cry every time certain um, medical groups that are I would consider them fringe continue to recommend hydroxychloroquine and ivermectin for the treatment of SARS-CoV-2. And I just read in my uh, all-time news uh, service, Yahoo News, uh, which a lot of you uh, can easily throw darts at, and, and correctly so, <clears throat> that the state of Kansas has approved the use of ivermectin and hydroxychloroquine as an alternative chemotherapy education. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, what, what exactly. do they have? What do they have Oz there? Is that the problem? I, no, no, no. That's a double. Oh, no. That's a double. Well, I sort of got that. That was kind of like a joke. But no, I got that one. <laughs> I did definitely get that one. And Oz. Well, so often on on Daniel's clinical update, he talks about, and I'm sure Daniel gets very frustrated about. It. We had Doris on in early 2020 when this was first was first found that it could inhibit. SARS-CoV-2 reproduction in cells and culture, right? And um, yeah, but that's, but that's, uh, a that's it's a big stretch because the the uh, the doses required to uh, inhibit in cell culture are not achieved in this twice yearly that, uh, that, that dosing exactly of humans, right? right? And she mentioned exactly. that, and she said you would have to do a trial with increased doses and make sure. And she said, you know, this is not without if you take high amounts. This is not without side effects because it hits our channel as well. <laughs> Didn't they do those, uh, Daniel? And they found nothing. So, so far, and we're waiting for a couple studies to still get out there. Um, so the COVID out um, is completed. It's actually submitted to New England Journal. So it's under, you know, embargo, as they say, until it's public. There was a study out of Brazil that Mills talked about. So we're hoping to see the data instead of just his sharing it with the Wall Street Journal. And then we still have that. <laughs> so there's still a few studies out there. Um, so we're looking at it. And then there's Kansas. <laughs> yeah, we're, li we're looking just, at it, but uh, unfortunately, there's a lot of people who believe that you know some things you just know they're true, so you you fudge the data to support your ideas instead of actually seeing what the science shows. So Without getting political, the former president who got sick from COVID, <laughs> you just got did political. Not, Dixon. <laughs> did not take ivermectin or hydroxychloroquine. He was right. given monoclonal antibodies and right. um, vaccines. Yep. So, you know. Yeah. All right. So we have a paper. <laughs> wait, wait. Before we do it's that, we have to paper? give away a book. A oh, yeah. That's right. Away a book. You, need you need a give drum away a, roll. You need a drum roll. We need to give. We had 20, uh, 20, 21 guesses. Right. So let me select a random number between Are one ready? and 21. <laughs> the number is two. <laughs> two. Number two. It's way at the top. Number two. I like it. Sarah. Number two. Oh, no, I got that wrong. Sarah. Eyal. Yeah. Oh. Eyal. Sydney, Australia. Oh, my gosh. Sydney, another, Australia. <laughs> another expensive uh, shipment. Okay. Uh, send it book rate. Send it book rate. It'll get there. I'm sure it will. But. <laughs> There's no book rate internationally. <laughs> Maybe it'll be cheaper if I travel there and bring it. I don't oh, think yeah. so. Yeah. <laughs> we'll buy you a plane ticket. <laughs> so, uh, within the U.S., book rate well, like is, think. is great, but uh, overseas— That's a Ben just, Franklin thing, right? The book rate in the U.S.? Is it? Really? I think so. I think it may go back. Anyway, it's or, fine. Yeah. Uh, AL, <laughs> um, send us your address and phone number and uh, send it to twip at microbe.tv, and I'm all caught up with sending out books. Um, Good on you. How about that? That's fantastic. Yeah, so uh, like we'll, we'll get that right out. Uh, so I can keep up. All right. There you go, Daniel. We have a, a what did you say? 
uh, a great paper, uh, Christina. <laughs> great, you, you, this you is pick, a good you're paper. doing great on picking the. This this is actually, I think, really a very important paper. So, yes. Christina, paper. do you want to lead us? Well, I can I can get us started, so we can maybe share the burden. Um, yeah. So um, this paper was. Yeah, I'm leaving. Goodbye. <laughs> 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 so this paper was published in the Lancet um, Global Health, and it is an open access paper. So I think we will have to reference in the show notes so everybody should be able to have a look at that if they wanted to do so. Um, so the title of the paper is Oral Fexinidazole for Stage 1 or Early Stage 2 African Trypanosoma brucei Gambiense Trypanosomiasis, a prospective multicenter open-labeled cohort study. Cohort study. And I'm now worried of getting the first author's name wrong, but I'll, I'll do my best. So the first author of this paper is Victor Kandebetu Kumesu, and the last author, so the corresponding author, I presume, would be Antoine Terral. And there's quite a lot of um, authors in between, and they mainly come from the Democratic Republic of Congo, but also um, from Drugs for Neglected Diseases Initiative in Geneva, in Switzerland, and um, I think the Swiss Tropical Institute is listed there as well, but mainly um, clinical centres in the Democratic Republic of the Congo. So I've, I've always been interested in trypanosomiasis. I did my PhD and, in fact, my MSc on um, a very niche project in African trypanosomes. So, you know, that interest has never really left me. And actually, when I chose that paper, I was just preparing for an outreach activity where I go into school and um, I always do. So it's Richard, my husband and I, we go to school together and um, we do some parasitic projects. So he usually just does a, a worm monocystis dissection um, to show apicoplexin parasites like malaria. So obviously we can't do malaria stuff at school. And I always do um, a sleeping sickness um experiment with the students where they have to do a, a diagnosis of um, three patients that have returned with sleeping sickness from Uganda. And we get them to do a um, CAT assay, so a card agglutination um, test for um, Gambiense trypanosomiasis. So that really kind of thought I'm going to read up a bit more because we always talk about treatment and diagnosis. And actually treatment for Sleeping sickness is really complex. So I don't know if our listeners remember. So there's two forms of African sleeping sickness. We have the um, a kind of a more um, fast progressing disease in Eastern Africa, which is caused by T. brucei rhodesiense and a much more slowly progressing um, form of the disease um, that is um, endemic in Western African countries mostly. So, and then we have two stages of the disease for both these parasites. So, an initial stage where the parasite lives in the blood and lymphatic system and multiplies and lives there quite happily until at some point um, it crosses the blood brain barrier and causes later stages of disease, which, um, you know, are neurological dysfunction, um, disruption of the sleep wakefulness rhythm and also personality changes and it usually is fatal if not treated. So we've got these two subspecies of Trypanosoma brucei and we've got these two forms of the disease or stages of the disease and each of them requires a different drug for treatment. So I think it's really complex and complicated and I don't know, should, should I go through should I go through the list or would that be too detailed? Um, you should, why, why don't I give an overview first? Well, why so don't you do that yet? I yeah, can take a breath through. and a glass of water. Yeah, you take a breath. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, so I think this is a great breakdown, right? There's the East African and there's the West African sleeping sickness. And, and how does a person acquire this? And Dixon, you jump in if you want to at any point. So it involves the tsetse fly, which really is a very incredible organism. It actually, um, it, live birth, it produces milk. I mean, it's not, you know, it's barely an insect in, in my mind. Um, they're quite different. The tsetse flies in East and West Africa. Um, true. And um, 
in so this is sort of critical in the life cycle. Um, we're not the only animals involved in the life cycle. So let's say you're in West Africa, um, you get bit by the TT fly, and it really is biting. I mean, they have these sharp um, bites that um, really cut the skin. Um, probably at least half the time or more people know, you know, hey, I've been bit. I'm um, actually going to develop this chancre where you get bit. Um, and that's the way that a person is get infected. Um, but not just people. In West Africa, we think that uh, pigs may be um, the, the reservoir. In East Africa, it's the game animals. Um, this study is going to look at West African. 97% of all sleeping sickness is West African. East African sleeping sickness is becoming incredibly rare. So maybe 3% is the, the current WHO estimation. So, you know, it's West Africa, you get bit, um, you develop first this um, hemolymphatic stage, which can last for quite a while and is treated a certain way. But then there's this late stage where it actually involves the CNS. Um, it might be a year from the time you get infected until the time it goes to that. In East Africa, it can be much quicker. Um, but the important thing here is treatment is really going to be dependent upon the stage. Um, and so Standard is actually to go ahead and do a lumbar puncture on these individuals, count the number of white blood cells in the CSF, and there's actually kind of a cutoff. There's even sort of a early and late, um, you know, CSF stage, um, and then the treatment can be challenging. So here we're looking at potentially an oral treatment for these individuals. Absolutely, um, we don't have one now. So this will be interesting. What what about this uh, this Fexinidazole. Um, it's a you, <laughs> you can't can yeah, no, no, no. I'm not going to go there. <laughs> one. You're not going to bait me into. <laughs> I could add just one thing to Daniel's uh, uh, executive summary, and that is that <clears throat> the vectors, when you say Sitsi fly, it's not just one species. There are multiple species of Glossina. Uh, that transmit this infection differentially, and they have host preferences, and they have uh, variable life cycles. Uh, for instance, as Daniel was, was saying, that in the on the west coast of Africa or the western side of Africa, I should say, the um, satsi flies breed along riverbanks, and they you can encounter millions of satsi flies within a square mile of a uh, river if you go up and down the river. This, this, this is not true for East Africa. You might find one satsi fly per mile. And that, if you have something that kills that satsi fly, you've just cleared out a mile's worth of uh, land that you don't have to worry about. It. Well, they'll repopulate, of course they will. And their biting habits are different. And it's it's in the East Africa, it's known as a tourist disease because a lot of people are going on safari. They go in these little... Um, VW buses that are painted up like zebras so they can actually get close enough to the zebras because if you don't, the zebras will all turn their behinds to you and then that's all the pictures you're going to get. It's just the rear end of a zebra. <laughs> Having been there, I can vouch for that one. But if you're in a zebra-colored uh, um, car, um, it also fools the zetsi flies. And they come over and they, thought, they think it's a zebra. <laughs> oh, it's not a zebra, but... Look at all those nice people inside. And so they start biting them instead. And you, Uganda that you mentioned, Christina, is unique in mm, being too, isn't perhaps it? the only country where East and West do meet. <laughs> they have a mixture. Where you can right. actually have both types. But normally you can just know which region you're in. That's going to help. Yeah. Um, right. But then, unfortunately, like this issue, couldn't we just give everyone an oral drug? Do we have to do lumbar punctures? Right. Do we have exactly. to make this distinction? Because that you can imagine that's quite something to have to stick yeah. a needle in you know someone's uh, back and, and obtain CSF and do a microscopic exam. That really changes the management. And I think that is really quite problematic in remote clinics. You know. You know, or people may not easily be able to go to a clinic. So quite often, maybe they will not be diagnosed as a result. So, um, yeah. So let's let's talk about the paper for, for a wee while. Um, so this drug is actually, this paper is actually a follow-up study on a previously published um, 
clinical trial where they were looking at the effectiveness of fexinidazole in late stage 2 African trypanosomiasis um, and that was very successful. So this is a, an add-on study really and here they were looking at the early stages of Western African sleeping sickness or the early stage 2 um, phase of the of the disease. So this was an open label study, so they didn't really compare like the drug that would normally be used for stage one infection is pentamidine. So it wasn't a, a, a blinded or comparative study. So what they did, it was an open label study. So all recruited patients were treated and then they were kind of comparing the effectiveness to pentamidine in this case uh, with historic data. So, um, so everybody who was identified was treated and there were eight centers in the Democratic Republic of the Congo that were involved. Now, I think, Daniel, you said about 97% of sleeping sickness is in West Africa and actually over 70% of that is in the DRC. So I think the vast majority of sleeping sickness cases nowadays we find in the Democratic Republic of Congo. So it makes sense. And I, I also the study actually what, the same centers are participating in this study as in the previous study. So that, that, you know, for comparative reasons, I suppose that is quite usual. So um, the patients, they have to be older than 15 years. And actually the inclusion criteria are quite interesting. So they have to be able to eat at least one complete meal um, per day or a, a sachet of plumpy nut. So, um, if What's they were, that? that? That's kind of a, 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 a Daniel maybe knows a li little bit more about it, but it's a full nutritional, um, so it's something that you might treat severely malnourished children with. Um, it's, it's just a, a complete meal, essentially. It's based on peanuts, if I remember correctly. So, mm -hmm. and I think the reason why this, I mean, it's quite an unusual criteria for inclusion, really. People have to be able to eat a meal. But the reason for that is that this drug has to be taken with a meal uh, for full effectiveness. So, from that point, it makes sense. Um, they also had to be well enough um, to... Um, you know that they, they may may have they may need some considerable assistance. So, they, they, but they wouldn't be too ill to need to be hospitalised yet. So, um, and they were assessing essentially the the level of disabledness as a result of sleeping sickness. So they had to be well enough, really. Um, so they had to have evidence of trypanosomes in the blood, but no evidence of trypanosomes in the CSF. Um, I mean, I think um, when you say eat a meal, it makes it sound like they're having difficulty swallowing. In, in actuality, uh, what they're saying is that if this patient is advanced into the sleeping sickness mm. stage where they can't wake up, yeah. you can't feed that person. Yeah, if they so might, just too the, might just be too unwell. Exactly. So, exactly. Um, so that was the inclusion criteria. Uh, so the excluded were people that were severely malnourished, uh, people that couldn't take medication, pregnant women, children. So people had to be over the age of 15. And also the patients couldn't have been treated for um, African trypanosomiasis in the previous two years. And they also were not allowed to be in, involved in the previous study. So... Um, and there were some other exclusion criteria. So the treatment really involves is a 10-day course of, of fexinidazole and it's two phasic. So initially you have a, a much kind of a higher loading dose. I actually thought that was quite a lot. It was like 1.2, 1.8 grams of fexinidazole um, once per day with a meal. And then they had a, a kind of a tapering phase, I suppose, where they were giving less, less drug. Um, and that had to be, usually had, had to be within 30 minutes of a main meal. And um, so, and the patients were then observed for the duration of the treatment and after, so after 11 days, and then they were followed up for um, up to 18 months. So 19 months altogether, really from pre-screening to the end of the study. 
and um, so they were looking at them. And I don't think we need to go into the outcome criteria. We can go straight to the results if you're happy with that. Um, I think that's <laughs> so, so were the patients. Oh, I need to say how many patients they had. So they had 238 patients that were assessed. And, um, you know, the vast majority had early stage, first stage right. um, sleeping right. sickness. And about, well, I don't know, maybe a quarter, they had early, late, early um, stage two sleeping sickness. So, and actually, you know, it's, it's quite a high number that completed the trial. So, a few were excluded because they didn't meet inclusion criteria. A couple withdrew consent. Um, and then during the trial period of 18, 19 months, um, uh, it's, it's a bit funny how they were it. So they say they were prematurely withdrawn, but they actually died. <laughs> that's, <laughs> yes. that's, that's, yeah. um, so four patients died, but of course it's unrelated to sleeping sickness. So, um, right. but so you know there was it was a high proportion of of patients that completed the trial. And actually, the take-home message is really that the treatment was effective at 12 months for 99% of the patients with quite a high confidence interval. That's amazing. Um, so what was, so what was, 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 the, what was, was the criteria for being effective? Like, what are they saying is the end point? So they, the end point was, if I remember correctly, without looking back, was having a white blood cell senkite below five per milliliter and um, no presence of trypanosomes. Ah, I think right. I, I would need to go back. That's, that's, no, the, right. that's well, what that's I skipped. Right. Um, yeah. So they were really zero trypanosomes. That's remarkable, right? It is. I think the parasitemia in um, Western African sleeping sickness is actually, you know, sometimes not really easy to demonstrate. So the parasitemia can be, you know, sometimes you, when you do a microscopy on a, on a patient, you don't always see trypanosomes yeah. in a yeah. blood film. So, um, but yeah, essentially... Um, so that was 99% of the first stage a patient with stage one trypanosomiasis, uh, the treatment was seen as effective. And 100% of the early stage two um, patients for them was the treatment was seen as effective. So, um, and from that, they concluded that really their primary endpoint of the study was met. And, you know, this is a, an effective disease. Um, at 18 months, so six months later, the treatment was still seen as effective in 98% of patients um, in the first stage of the disease and 98%, I think. No, sorry, I'm cutting that. And yeah, 98% of the early stage two trypanosomiasis as well. So really a very effective treatment. Um, <clears throat> so, and... It, I mean, this drug is not without side effects, I should say. So, you know, there's a lot of nausea and vomiting. Um, but I think the side effect profile is probably comparable to the drug that is currently used, pentamidine. Well, that's what the author said. And um, so from that point of view, you know, because it can be orally administered, so it could potentially be an outpatient treatment, which obviously would be really interesting um, for treatment Um particularly in areas where there's not such good access to healthcare settings. And so, um, whereas pentamidine, which is currently used, that has to be, um, I think it's intramuscularly administered over seven days or so. So this would really be a hospital treatment. And, um, you know, that would then, if you had an oral treatment, so it could be outpatient, but it would also not take the families away or the patients away from the family. They could be cared for in the home. So I think it has a lot of advantages. And in terms of effectiveness, they're quite comparable, really. But obviously, an oral administration of the drug has, is hugely um, interesting. So um, from a safety perspective, I think, you know, it's also right. good. Although actually then I was reading up and I was thinking, what about other trypanosomes? Um, so 
you know, what what does it look like there? And actually, um, so at the moment, another study is ongoing um, that was looking at the effectiveness of fexinidazole, fexinidazole in East African trypanosomiasis. And again, that is an open label study. And obviously that's going to take a while because there are, are, are just not that many patients. So I looked at the clinicaltrials.gov.uk and um, I think they have 45 patients enrolled um, and 15 have already completed. And it looks like to be also a really effective treatment for East African trypanosomiasis. So potentially we, we, we might have an oral treatment for all sleeping sickness, just the one medication. And wouldn't that be amazing? It would. And then so I, I got carried some... away. Yeah, I looked at, what about Chagas disease? <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 no. Yeah. Totally different. Totally different. Well, not totally really, different. No, no. So totally different. May have, uh, may have efficacy there too. Yeah, so they, they have, they're actually diverse. Uh, there was a couple of trials ongoing, but there is safety um, kind of tolerability issues because in that case, you know, they, they're kind of they're obviously the parasites live in different parts of the body. Less, you know, the, the drug is maybe less available in these tissues. So the treatment is actually eight weeks. So they were just kind of looking. Well, what do we need? I think. They're using benz benzinidazole. Ben, I can't pronounce that. Benzinidazole. Benzinidazole. Yeah, so I think that's. I think the treatment is about eight weeks. So they, they mirrored that really in the trial, and there were some really quite hepato, um, you know, some liver liver dysfunction. So they did abort that. Um, but I think trials are being underway again in Spain now. Uh, but I haven't really seen any results on that. So, but I thought, you know. Potentially, we could treat all trypanosomes and maybe even Lishmania, who knows? Because in vitro, uh, in vitro it has this drug is <laughs> also effective against um, Lishmania donovanae. So, you know, I think there's a huge potential. And maybe that's why I got really excited about that, that treatment. It's true. I have a big question, though. Ooh. That is. Big questions are will- scary. <laughs> Just one, just one, okay. and, and it, but it's a big, big question. These people all come from the surrounding areas. Uh, they were obviously exposed to sensi flies. They caught the disease, the infection, I should say, and then they got the mild disease, and then they were treated. The treatment only lasted, what, 12, 12 weeks? Ten days. It, ten ten days. Days, less than that, ten days. Then they went back to where they caught the disease. Yeah. 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 Why didn't yeah. they become reinfected? Well, I don't know. Um, they didn't, I, I, come on, Christine. They didn't discuss the that. I mean, the testify is still there. So, uh, yeah. Is there any... I mean, are you immune afterwards? That's right. I'm um, asking, is there any immunity? Yeah. I, I'm not sure, actually. That would be hard to imagine yeah, with I'd, trypanosoma. I'd, yeah, because... Brucei. Yeah. Because don't you don't that. even know which uh, antigenic variant uh, you had at the point of starting the treatment. Yeah, so. yeah. So I I don't think there is immunity after infection because that was actually, they had to exclude people who had a severe case from being in the next trial. So unfortunately with African sleeping sickness, you can get reinfected after after treatment, after survival. Um, But not with this drug because there's no data yet. But um, we, we could hope that this is a permanent eradication of the disease, right? I, I don't think you it is, right? Because they had people coming back that had been treated and cured in the first trial, right? Yeah. So the late stage. Yeah. And then they showed up and they're like, yeah, I know you got African sleeping sickness, but you were in the first trial and now you're a reinfection. We're excluding you. Yeah. So unfortunately, uh, right. Right? right? And then right. we've got the pig reservoir. Mm. So the tsetse flies are out there. They're yeah. infected. They're biting the pigs. They're biting, you know, us. So yeah, that's, that's one of the problems, reinfection. Mm. I think you really have to do, you know, with together with vector controls, it has to be a, a big public health response, really, which is difficult in a country like the Congo, the Democratic Republic of Congo, which is really yeah, politically really difficult. unstable. So um, I, I think eradication, but there is, I mean, I think there is a target for elimination by 2030. So um, I don't know how realistic that will be. Um, mm-hmm. But certainly, I mean, the numbers away. are really low. There's only about 900 cases of sleeping sickness 
in 2019, which I think is the most up-to-date data that we have. So the numbers have come down from the, you know, Way tens down. of thousands. Um, That's right. Um, but, but yeah, the, the, in in West Africa, the further away you live from a river, the less chance you will have of even acquiring this. But of course, the river is your lifeline, and you need water for lots of things: transportation, drinking, hydropower. Um, and it creates these big problems. A lot of hydroelectric dams have been put up in West Africa because there's a lot of aluminum in the soil. And you can smelt out the aluminum in the soil by uh, high-voltage electricity, which is generated by these dams. So they've created reservoirs above them for the riverine variety of trypanosome vector. And it's sort of like, it's not shooting yourself in the foot, it's just shooting yourself in the head. <clears throat> it's a difficult situation because they're not going to eliminate the hydroelectric dams just because some people come down with trypanosomiasis. And actually, there's also the issue you mentioned of reinfection and, you know, maintaining the life cycle is now being shown that yeah, trypanosomes yeah. can yeah. actually be in the skin. So there's trypanosomes yeah, in sure. skin reservoirs. Sure. So obviously, you know, that without people being symptomatic. So that can then reinitiate an infection cycle quite easily. I was wondering though, how would you how would you know if you have that drug, you know, do you go out there, screen and treat? Ah. Obviously with with having we have this really quite simple um serologic test that we can do on these little black cards. So I think that would probably be a possibility for West Up, but you know, I, I'm just wondering how would you approach a public health response now having that drug? Would you go out and screen and treat? Or would you be would you be more reactive if someone comes? Um I suppose that really depends on 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 the funding available for this kind of public health. Um Campaigns. At least the at least the diagnosis treat would be easier, right? This person comes, you do these um, this cat the cardioglutination test. You say, okay, you've right. got the diagnosis. You know what? We're not going to do an LP. I want you to take um, you know this oral medicine for ten days. Ninety nine percent, you're going to be good. Yeah, um, you know. Yeah. So that it's a lot easier than the current, you yeah. know, okay, we're going to have to do a lumbar puncture. We're going to have to stage you. We're going to have to inject you in the leg every day for seven days. You got to keep coming back here. Um, yeah, at least the first part, you know, and, and then you've got to ask like, okay, so we see 900 cases a year. We can treat 900 cases a year. Um, do we need Correct. to go out and, and invest in a mass drug? So, yeah. Remember, the uh, real reason for wanting to cure this infection is not for people. They want to cure European cattle so that they can introduce them into Africa. And European cattle acquire this infection and they die. The African cattle don't, but they're not very good to eat. So you've got these economic conflicts. Uh, so there's a center in Nairobi called the International Laboratory for Research on Animal Diseases, ILRAD, which I visited many, many years ago, uh, just after it was established. And the whole um, raison d'etre, so to speak, is cure the cattle disease and you can open up a whole economic uh, growth industry in East Africa, which, of course, the domestic cattle will displace all the wildlife, too. Don't, don't forget about that. So it was a bad idea from the start, <clears throat> but um, I think at this point, was it, will this drug work in cattle? That's what I was going to ask. Well, there's a developmental vaccine for cattle, trypanosomiasis, I think. Um, I, I read a paper about a year ago, so may, maybe for the really? cattle, yes, I did. Um, I think it was yeah. published in Nature or in Science. So that, Remember they're trying to go after that little sort of the, the mouth. Yeah, the, the only part that the, yeah. the, the coat of the yeah. trypanosome doesn't get around, right? Yeah, the invariant portion mm. right there in the it's, it's where they absorb all their nutrients. Yeah. That's yep. that's where they come through. That's right. That's right. Because I think treating cattle with a ten day course, I don't know, would that be financially viable for a farming well, community? Well, yeah, get you treat them just before you sell them. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, yeah, but then you have to give them time to recover, don't they, to put on some weight? Well, this is true. Yeah. This yeah. is true. This is true. So remember, the person who discovered this organism started his work, I believe it was in Malta, 
working on brucellosis in cattle. And that's why it was called brucellosis. And that's why it's called Trypanosoma brucei as well. He, he wanted to find out about cattle diseases and solve that problem and open up those economic regions for development. Um, and he gave up on the uh, trypanosomes as soon as he couldn't tell the difference between East African and West African trypanosomes. Under the microscope, they are exactly alike. There's no way to tell them apart. I think he was they, a Scotsman, wasn't quite, he? So David Bruce, he was, Bruce, he was a Scotsman. Probably still is. Yeah, well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if he's still with us. He's not enjoying it as much as he used to, I must say that. <laughs> <laughs> No, Christina, thank you so much. That was, yeah, that was great. That was, no, that was a nice. great. Do you know of any other drug Very nice. that's had such a remarkable um, clinical result? I mean, 100%. That's un, unheard of, basically, even with penicillin. Maybe not the efficacy, and, uh, but certainly the impact, like ivermectin, has had a huge impact. That's No, that's yeah. true, too. That so, is absolutely you know, There are right. other great drugs. Um, has this got another... Uh, set of diseases that it addresses. It sounds a little like an antifungal drug. I don't know. I'm I not did, sure, I, I is didn't it? read up on it, what, it's, what it it's is. A, uh, it's an old drug. It was discovered in the 80s and sh and just ignored. At some point, someone must have tested it against penicillin. Yeah, it's got, it's got that same last name, but it's a nitro imatazole. So it's actually somewhat related to metronidazole. Uh, so uh, think right. of it as that kind of a, yeah, it's a nitro. Oh. Or benzinidazole. Exactly. Yeah. So it's, it's not in the, in the azole antifungal group. It's a sort of different, different okay. mechanism. So. I think it was anyway. taken up by the drug for in um, neglected diseases initiative, um, which yep. is kind uh -huh. of been, you know, trying to repurpose drugs that already exist, but Absolutely. also develop new drugs Absolutely. for this disease. It's actually a really good website. Maybe we can put that in the show notes. Really interesting. Yeah. I remember they had one that would um, stimulate hair growth. Oh, that, that, <laughs> that's um, Eflornithin. That's right. Yeah, they, were, they were charging yeah. like $200 an ounce for mm. this stuff for your yeah. hair, and it was not being used for the right purpose, yeah. basically. Yeah. I was looking the side effects. I was looking up the side effects for that drug today, and I couldn't find any information with regards to trypanosomiasis. Just with hair loss treatment, I thought oh, this is a bit shallow, really. I mean, that you know. <laughs> so anyway, mustn't ramble on. Well, do we have a hero, Dixon, for this time? We don't have a hero. That is our okay. Wait a minute. It's, I have a hero, but it's not. She's not a parasitologist. She just recently passed away, uh, like three days ago, Madeline Albright. Oh, okay. And Madeline Albright was our uh, first woman secretary of state. And she was an aggressive, knowledgeable, remarkable woman who cleared the way for a lot of other appointments at a very high level in government for women. And um, we've been pushing that um, concept trying to find heroes in parasitic diseases or in medicine. And this is a politician, but I'm, I'm certain that through the State Department, a lot of um, useful agreements were made between countries that needed our help in terms of disease transmission. Uh, I'm positive, in fact, because this Department of State deals with all that. And uh, USAID is a... a subtended underneath the Department of State. So, um, and they, that's all they do is basically give aid for um, intractable problems. So Madeleine Albright, I will pick her as my hero. I'm sorry, I do have a hero. All right. And, and that's my hero. Thank you, Dixon. Daniel, well, do you have a case? Yes, I uh, have my book what? here. <laughs> so let me, uh, let me look. So here, here we are. We're, we're going to do three cases in Ghana before we move on. So this is another case from Ghana. Um, and this is a, uh, a pregnant woman. She's about 20 years of age. She's living in eastern Ghana um, in this area near the Volta River Delta. So it's this very wet, um, a lot of fresh water exposure. She's, you know, in the river quite a bit. Um, this is not far from the coast. Um, she's pregnant. She's in her second trimester. This is not her first pregnancy. Um, and she comes in reporting abdominal pain, diarrhea. Uh, there's some blood in the diarrhea. 
um, the physician requests a stool examination. Um, I get a chance to look at this stool under the microscope. So, you know, it's exciting for me. Um, and we're, we're able to find a couple um, ovoid forms under the microscope. So one is about 160 microns, um, and it's sort of oval-shaped. Um, so 160 microns along the long axis. And uh, there are several of these, um, and they're characteristic, and they have these single lateral projections, um, sort of a pointy lateral projection. Um, but there's also a few other um, ovoid forms, which are about 45 by about 30 microns. Um, and these, if you look closely, you can see that they have these polar bodies within them. Daniel, I wish I had had you as a professor when I was going to school. That's all I can tell you. <laughs> you are um, graphic in your descriptions. I, I, I appreciate them very much. All right. So, uh, so we will. I'm going to leave that out there so uh, people can take a guess. What might we be talking about here? And, and what do we do? What do we do? So if either one of these, you want both of them to be considered – Obviously, for what's going on. Tell, tell me, you know this. This is a. This is one of those real situations. This is what happened, and and what it. This what, is what, what happened. What did we do? I'll share that. What should we have done? Um, you can tell me that. Um, and then. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you, Daniel. That'll do it for TWIP two hundred four. You'll find the show notes at microbe.tv slash twip if you want to send in a case guess or just a question or comment. Twip at microbe.tv. If you like what we do, we need your help. Consider supporting us, microbe.tv slash contribute. Daniel Griffins at Columbia University Irving Medical Center, parasiteswithoutborders.com. Thanks, Daniel. Oh, thank you. And everyone be safe out there. Dixon de Palmier is at trichinella.org, thelivingriver.org. Thank you, Dixon. Thank you so much uh, for not only an entertaining program, that's fun to participate in, but um, I've learned a lot. So thank you. Christina Naul is at the University of Glasgow. Thanks, Christina. Thank you. It was really enjoyable to be here and have a enjoy the rest of your day. I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at virology.ws. I'd like to thank the American Society for Microbiology for their support of TWIP and Ronald Jenkins for the music. You've been listening to This Week in Parasitism. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back soon. Another twip it is Did it.